Welcome class to our final lecture in the in the benthic uh, unit and before our final exam, or I'm sorry, midterm exam don't want to scare you, there is no final exam in this class but um, the, the benthic unit wouldn't be complete unless we went over the extreme benthic uh, communities um, which are important in, in terms of their the, the way that they um, function and in terms of their diversity and, and, and biomass and the role that they play. Um, and what do I mean by uh, exceptions to the rule or an extreme community? And first we can take a look at the typical benthic community food chain and how it works. Um, and we went over this in the previous less, lesson, the mini lesson capture. Um, and the typic, typical benthic community has these these uh, two primary inputs of organic matter to the benthic community and that's uh, primary production by either micro or macro algae or we can have sinking organic matter through sedimentation of of um, from the processes that occur in the in the surface ocean to to the uh, benthic environment which ultimately end up as dissolved organic matter um, or can be directly kind of consumed by some of these I didn't really go over that but but it can ha it, that does happen um, especially with deposit feeders um, but in the typical sense we have the, the dissolved organic matter pool becoming bacteria which is consumed by a protozoa which is consumed by the next the next uh, consumer up in the trophic level like a, like a benthic copepod which are then consumed by the various um, macroorganisms and finally the top predators um, and these things can be recycled or removed through burial and we said that um, an important recap is that um, if if the organic matter and the material associated with the elements and compounds associated with it make it through all these processes are not recycled, make it through diagenesis of bacteria, um, they become um, removed through this burial, um, which is important because this removes them for on the order of a hundred thousand years or more, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, essentially taking this organic matter out of the global biogeochemical cycling. And we said that if this system, this all of these interactions and this recycling is efficient, then we have high recycling and less burial. But if it's a short food chain or a very inefficient food chain, um, low efficiency, then we have high burial. The first of the extreme communities, um, or the one of one of the two that I'm going to go over, um, is the coral reef community. So we don't get in this community um, the same types of energy input, right? We don't get primary production in the traditional sense, and we don't get sedimentation as the organic matter input. Um, but the um, but we do get a unique system. Now what makes the coral reef community extreme in the sense of uh, bending the rules? Uh, coral reef are usually relatively shallow. There are deep corals, um, but the coral reef community is shallow, so it, it, it undergoes very high light intensity. It occurs in clear water, shallow depths, so very high light, in light intensity, and that can inhibit things like photosynthesis, as we know. Uh, there are very little nutrients for growth of of phytoplankton or anything in the typical sense of organic matter input in a shallow uh, water uh, environment. Uh, whereas the diversity is sort of mediocre in, at best in most, and by diversity I mean number of species present uh, no matter what trophic level we're talking about in the water column is, is usually about mediocre um, it's super high in a coral reef the the number of species in a in a square in a cubic meter square meter um, is very high and so is the productivity okay so the actual production the primary production that goes on the secondary production the consumption and the recycling is all very high relative to the rest of the ocean and it's all over a small area in this reef community so what it, what makes it unique? Where does it get its energy from? Well, a coral. Go back for one second here. A coral um, is actually a polyp uh, organism. It's in the Nidarian family, so it's a relative of the jellyfish, and it's kind of like a little tiny upside down jellyfish. And what we know of as the white part of the coral is a skeleton. So they secrete the skeleton, and in each one of these little orifices here, one of these polyps grows. Now, in the tissue of this coral polyp, so if we look and dissect the tissue of a coral polyp here, these little brown and greens and all the colors that you associate with a coral, 
uh, we go inside the tissue there are all these different layers of tissue in here they have these stinging cells called nematocysts which shoot out if we if we if we take this dissect it and come down here we see that in here there's these little nematocysts see these little spring-like structures they, they actually have little darts on them they can shoot out and sting things and trap them and bring them in as food but if we go one tissue layer deeper we have these little circles right here these are actually um, a type of photosynthesizing algae called zooxanthellae so there's an algae that lives in their tissue layers and that's what these colors are these browns and greens All right so there's an algae like this living in the in the coral tissue and that gives it its color inside each of the polyps so what those do for the coral the algae photosynthesizes they take up the nutrients that they need which actually happens to be a waste product of the coral polyps right the coral polyps uh, they ingest certain organisms and they create this waste that would make their environment toxic except the algae need that waste in in the form of a nutrient so they take up the toxins um, they take up the CO2 they turn it into glucose and sugar the glucose and sugar feeds the coral polyp um, and it's a very neat symbiosis that goes on here the, the, um, the algae, the zooxanthellae that live in their tissues get to photosynthesize the, or the, the coral polyps get to live toxin free and get sugar and detoxified by the algae and that is essentially the basis for um, organic matter and energy input to a coral reef reef um, ecosystem and all other organisms like the fish and the large organisms that live in there live off of that as the base of their um, food chain the second community I want to go over that you want you guys to be aware of is the hydrothermal vent community so this is extreme in the opposite sense of a coral reef community and what I mean by in the opposite sense is where a coral reef is very shallow with very high light, the coral uh, hydrothermal vent community is very deep with basically no light. Okay, so the, the hydrothermal vent community occur at plate tectonic boundaries that we spoke about. Um, and at these plate, tec te plate tectonic boundaries, pardon me, um, are these vents, right? So magma material vents hot liquid fluid at these vents. Um, and it's very toxic water that comes out of here. So there's a lot of chemical compounds in here. Um, one of the one of the um, more famous ones or infamous, I should say, is hydrosulfide, hydrogen sulfide, um, that pour out of these vents. And so the characteristics that make up this community is they're isolated, extreme environments, very low temperature because they're very deep, and no sunlight, right? No light because they're very deep. They're dependent on symbiosis with microbes, so not algae, but bacteria, prokaryotes. Now their production is the same as a, as a coral reef. It's very high, but it's very localized, so it's only around each of these vents that we get one of these communities. And their diversity in abstract to the coral reef is very, very low, so you only get one species of clan, one species of giant tube worm. You don't get multiple species or, or multiple types of species at each trophic level. You get very low. But the organisms are also very large in comparison to other ecosystems. So how does this work? Where does the energy come from? Right? We don't get sedimentation here in high amounts. We don't get primary production in the typical sense in high amounts. So how does it work? Well in both the larger tube worms and clams and several other organisms that grow around here but here we'll use the tube worm as an example right tube worms such as this can grow up to be meters long so very long so they have these gill plumes and these these tube bodies where their organs and organelles are all structured inside they filter the water around them so we have this toxic water that comes out of these plumes from the vents they take in this water and circulate it through their bodies. Now, I say toxic, so how do they live? Well, if we take a certain section of their body, which is a large portion of their body, and dissect it and enlarge it um, in an, this large organ called the troposome cells, uh, you can see their arteries, which is represented by this red thing, so their, their, I should say their capillaries, their, their blood vessels, run very close to these troposome cells. Inside these troposome cells live bacteria, 
So we have another very unique, very important symbiosis that goes on here. These bacteria live in these cells. As the blood circulates here, and the water circulates through here, the bacteria detoxify the water. They take up CO2, they take up hydrogen sulfide, they take up some oxygen, and they, use, they break the bonds of this hydrogen sulfide to metabolize the CO2. So it's primary production, but it's chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis. This is one of the primary places that we see a large use of chemosynthesis. Um, so they, they break the bonds of the hydrogen sulfide, use the energy provided by that to fix CO2. Um, they still utilize some oxygen, and they do two things at once. They produce sugar, right? They turn inorganic carbon into organic carbon. They produce carbohydrates or, or, or sugars um, for the worms, for the tube worms or the larger organisms. It could be a clam. It could be some a couple of other organisms that live in symbiosis with these guys. But they also detoxify the water. So you can see in here we have bacteria taking hydrogen sulfide and oxygen and creating ATP and ADPH, these energy molecules um, for the worms. And that is the basis of organic matter input or energy input to these um, highly unique and extreme environments, ecosystems. And here we have a, a video of, of some of these vents and how they just constantly are venting this toxic water from magma and plate tectonic activity and how they can fuel these very um, um, very unique and individualized and localized communities, but you can see it can be very dense and highly productive. Gigantic tube worms, gigantic clams, a few fish in here that come in and there's there's lots of crustaceans. Um, you can see these large crabs right there. Um, large crabs and, and you get some large crustaceans, but very, very um, very low diversity, single species of crab, single species of fish, single species of tube worm. Um, and essentially uh, that's it for our extreme communities. So the only, those are the only two I want you to be responsible for. And I just want you to know the difference between these, these important um, communities that get their energy input, their organic matter input, or the base of their food chain um, in a very different way from the typical sense. Thanks for joining me. See you next lesson.